name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So Bishop William Williman, when he was the dean of the, uh, of the, of the cathedral church or the chapel at Duke, uh, tried to express to his students uh, that there are certain boundaries and gates that must be respected. He told them, if you want to graduate from Duke University, you better respect the English department. The path to graduation goes through the English department. If you want to practice law, you better pass the bar. And if you want to be a doctor, well, organic chemistry must be respected. And if you want to get to the joy of Bethlehem, you must go through John the Baptist. So like organic chemistry, here we are today with the second Sunday in this calendar year, as we have uh, two Sundays in year C, uh, we meet John the Baptist. And I'm going to tell you two things today, which will probably get me electrocuted or lightning will come somewhere close to me. It depends how quick my feet are. Uh, the first is I'm going to challenge Abraham Lincoln and something he said. Uh, and the second is that I don't think John the Baptist said everything that we are crediting with him with saying today. Um, I think the Lincoln one's probably going to get me more trouble than the other. But uh, So Abraham Lincoln uh, would go to church every Wednesday evening. He'd go to uh, New York Presbyterian Church right near, uh, right near the White House. Uh, and he would go. And, of course, afterwards, uh, the usher would say, well, you know, Mr. President, what would you think of the sermon? And on this particular day, uh, this particular Wednesday evening, he said, the content was spectacular, incredibly well-crafted, and eloquently delivered. So he was still milling outside, and he heard the usher uh, expressing that the president had thought it was an incredible sermon, to which Lincoln corrected him. He said, I did not say it was an incredible sermon. I said it was beautifully crafted and eloquently delivered. He said, uh, Pastor Gersley forgot one critical point. Every good sermon must dare you to be great. And I think there, there is a nugget of truth in that, but I think we've heard lots of wonderful examples of people who have been great. We've heard examples of, 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 of Romeo, uh, we've heard examples of Desmond Tutu, of Mother Teresa, and we go back into our own lives relatively unchanged. I think a good sermon dares us to be better than when we walk through those doors, to dare us to take one step towards greatness, towards betterness. I think that's the path to greatness. It's taking one step a little bit farther than when we came in these doors. And I think that's what Luke understood. Uh, but I think John was angry. John was like a lot of us, probably a lot of us today, where we flip on the news and we're angry. We are flip on the news and we want a revolution. We want something to change. We want the world to look like we think God intended it to. And our, sheep, our teeth are sharp. And John's were certainly sharp. Can you imagine running into John on the street? Uh, can you imagine running into John at a, at, at, at a gathering? I don't think John went from, you brood of vipers. To, if you have two coats, give one. I don't think that that's John the Baptist. I think Luke, who had the lens of quite a few years of listening uh, to all of the other reports of John the Baptist where he doesn't relent at all. He goes from you brood of vipers, the axe is at the tree, to, uh, the, to Jesus is coming in the winnowing floor. And then he's kind of upset with Jesus because Jesus isn't throwing enough people in the fire. The revolution isn't happening fast enough. But I think Luke understood something. Luke understood that we need to at least take one foot in front of the other that we got to put one foot forward before we can change the world, and that we can rail against all the things that are wrong, and anger can start to grow and, and just infest us. But the best way to shift our lives towards being open to Christ is to just put one foot in front. And I think those words in between, that middle paragraph, I think is Luke's commentary on John, who I think John is incredibly incredibly authentic. I think John is, is powerful in his example and in his witness, but I think John is unrelenting. But I think we need to just take a couple steps towards Jesus, a couple steps towards the light. And I think that's what Luke invites us to do. 
to do things that we can do to help get that poison out of our own hearts, to help journey towards what is greatness, what will happen in less than two weeks to that Christ that is always coming into our lives. We can't see if our backs turn. So Luke says, just take one or two steps. Go through your closet, and if you have a couple extra coats, maybe give them away. You don't need all of them. Some you haven't worn in years. And if you've got more food than you know what to do with, if you're trying to figure out how to uh, limit your intake, then maybe you might be able to do something for those that haven't had a square meal in days. And if you have a job where you, you make money at the expense of others, maybe you just make sure that you're doing it justly. You're only asking for what you need or what you're entitled to. And if you're a soldier, he's not even called you to lay down your arms. He's just saying, don't overuse your power. It comes with great responsibility. Do it faithfully. Do it with a heart for those that you're serving. And whatever you do, just take one or two steps closer to Christ so that your eyes might be open to what is truly great, to the power of us collectively working our journey towards greatness. One of the Strange things about this particular Sunday, and uh, I always feel like the, they just must have messed up the readings because we light the pink candle. We sometimes even call it Mary Sunday, and the readings have nothing to do with Mary um, at, on most years. Uh, and we have this joy Sunday, and the readings didn't necessarily overwhelm us with joy. Uh, but I think that uh, those prayers we read at the very beginning have been particularly helpful, and I read it last time I got up here. Uh, but I do agree that joy is not necessarily what we think. Joy is not necessarily just that moment of, uh, of, of lightness or, um, or, or whatever we try to fill our lives with to get joy. I think joy is something that's like a muscle that I agree with that idea. That it's a muscle that we need to train. Uh, and joy comes from leading a meaningful, purposeful life. From doing what we were created to do. It's not necessarily what we think it will be. And we have these three passages uh, Zephaniah is railing against, uh, against Judah, and uh, he's a prophet that God uh, called to go and warn the people of Judah uh, that, that basically all mayhem was going to break loose, that they had failed so many times to, to, to follow God, that mayhem was going to ensue, uh, but at the end, God is still faithful. And so even after all of, most of that letter is nothing but the mayhem that will take place, and then we have that very end uh, that rejoice. God is still with you, that God loves you enough to redirect your lives uh, towards God, that this is not God abandoning you, but God calling you to something greater, and it will come through chaos, uh, but in the end, uh, your lives will be, will be bent towards God, and God's love will never, ever wane. Then we have Paul, who's in jail, who's preaching from jail and shouting through the jail bars, rejoice. And that's not a, a lighthearted, jolly Rejoice, but that's almost a revolutionary rejoice. Even prison bars can't keep you from the joy of knowing that you are God's beloved, that God is so invested in you that nothing that this world can do can separate you from that love. And so you defiantly say, Rejoice. We have John the Baptist who gives us kind of hard news, but at the end says, This is the good news. God loves you enough to love you as you are, but loves you too much to let you stay that way. And John comes, hoping that we just flip 180 degrees, but sometimes softened by the, uh, the, by the distance of time, Luke reminds us that we start with one foot, and we start shifting our lives just a little bit, so that when that day comes, when Christ enters our lives, we're facing him, and our eyes are open, and we're expecting good, to give way to the greatness of the one who is to come, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen.